family doctor. My clinical work is at Baycrest. I work on this uh, uh, behavioral support unit and doing home visits outreach as well. Um, I'm here today as president of the Ontario Long-Term Care Physicians, and we represent over 300 medical directors and attending physicians working in long-term care. So this afternoon's session is about person-centered care. We have three speakers, Dr. Marie Savandra Nayagam, um, Sonia Murray, and Dr. Joshua Tepper from Health Quality Ontario. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce each speaker um, as they come up. They're going to give their 15-minute PowerPoint um, quick talk on their subject, and then at the end, hopefully, we'll have about 10 minutes left for some questions and answers. So. Okay, so um, Marie is a um, from University of Western Ontario. Her research focuses on caregiving relationships through enhanced communication, identifying ways to enhance personhood for individuals with dementia, and uncovering mechanisms by which caregiver interventions are effective. She received the Canadian Institute of Health Research's Age Plus Award for her work on communication problems and the burden among family caregivers. Her current research aims to assess the effectiveness of communication strategies used by caregivers to resolve communication breakdown and investigate the differential impact of effective versus ineffective strategies in predicting caregiver burden. Welcome. All right, today um, in this afternoon session, I'm going to focus on um, communication as an aspect of person-centered care, because person-centered care encompasses various aspects um, of care in the nursing home. So this particular presentation will only focus on the communication and the role of communication in providing person-centered care to people with um, dementia. So in the, in the nursing home, we know that, that it's hard work. And for the most part, it's a, um, m most people are trained to provide task-oriented communication. And the whole goal of person-centered communication is really to move from tasks, like while you're actually doing the care tasks, can you be person-centered? So to, to understand what is person-centered communication, um, there is a researcher, was a researcher named Tom Kitwood, and he identified various indicators of person of personhood or person-centered care. And so these four um, are the ones that are very specific to communication. Recognition. Do you acknowledge the resident by name? Do you, uh, do you greet them? Do you incorporate their life history? Negotiation, that's pretty straightforward. Do you ask about preferences? And, and are those preferences based on that, the social or life history? Facilitation has two parts. Um, one of them is like a, a conversation starter. Do you, are you able to talk to the resident about their, again, life history? But then this, the other part is about if you see a resident kind of initiating a task, can you facilitate and help make that, help complete that action? And then finally, we have validation, which is acknowledging feelings. The biggest difference between the last two, facilitation and um, uh, validation, is that validation is more on the feeling level, and facilitation is on the, act um, the action level. All right, so the goals of our study um, was to look at whether communication was person-centered. Um, so that was the, f the first role. And then the second goal was to look at, well, are there some, some spots in the communication where the staff member could have been person-centered but somehow missed that opportunity? And when I give you the examples, it, it will make um, a lot more sense. So what we had were um, 13 dyads over four points in time over the course of 12 weeks. And actually what we did is, you know those iPod armbands you use when you're running? We, we put um, those on, our, uh, on the staff uh, people and um, we inserted a digital mini recorder so that it didn't get in the way when they're performing uh, you know, their, their duties. 
And um, you can see that we had most of our conversations, we had 46 conversations, and most of them were with people in the, um, the later stages of dementia, which is reflective of who is in the nursing home. And what we did was code the conversations, we transcribed them, and then coded them for those four personhood indicators. And then we also looked at, we looked through the conversations and said, you know, are there spots where a staff person could have been person-centered but somehow missed that opportunity? And then the way that the data was analyzed is to look at, okay, what was the form of these missed opportunities? And also, did they, was there a certain function in those missed opportunities? And then the second part of the analysis was to look at the general social context to understand, are there some clues that we can get about how to be person-centered by looking at the context? I think the examples are the ones that, is, that really hit the home the key points. Um, the first finding is that person-centered care is possible. Because we can see here over 30% of the conversations were person-centered. It's important to note that we went in during morning care, which is a really tough time, and during evening care, another tough time. So we can see here that person-centered communication is possible even though you're providing care at a very you know, more stressful time um, within the day. And that's the first key point. Um, the second point is that we see we see that there are missed opportunities around like the 11% mark. 11% of the conversations had missed opportunities, and we'll take a look at what we can learn from those uh, missed opportunities. So let's here are some examples of of good person-centered communication. So here we have, you know, has your daughter been here today? So that's recognition. Ah, uh, no, she comes on the weekend, don't she? Again, it's recognition because it's showing that the staff person knows the schedule of the daughter, that the daughter comes and visits and uh, is an important person to that resident. And then she's, the resident says, oh, just the weekend. Here's negotiation. You want to sit here and watch the news or do you want to go up front? go you know go down um, so again just asking for preferences is a good example of negotiation um, I've got two examples for facilitation so when you was young what were your hobbies so you're starting up a conversation about the person's social or life history you know I like to sew and then that kind of conversation actually went on really nicely um, here's another example where the, the resident is initiating some desire, like I need coffee, and then the staff person says, we're going to make sure that you get some. So that's what we mean. Those are two different types of facilitation. And then finally, we have validation. Remember, that's all about acknowledging feelings. I always get lost in this place oh, I would never let you be lost. So that's really validating. And you can see that it's validating because of what the resident says. No, you wouldn't. So now let's take a look at the missed opportunities, which are quite interesting. So in terms of form, there were two patterns that we saw. Sometimes we saw the missed opportunities, they would just occur randomly on their own. Um, and that was 33% of the time. And then we saw this really interesting pattern where the staff person was person-centered, so it's the conversation started off really well, and then somehow it just stopped. It went it, and then the, we found these missed opportunities. And so that's what we've coded as person-centered with missed opportunity for person-centered communication. And that was 67% of the time. So we want to pay attention to that. Um, so that was the form. Now to look at the function. So w w like what, what was actually happening in these missed opportunities? Well, in 40% of the cases, they were alternatives. So the staff person would say something, and it just could have been said a little bit better so that it was person-centered. So we're changing or providing an alternative to what was said. And then 60% were omissions, where there's a complete, oops, I didn't, um, you know, there was a real miss, that's like a true missed opportunity, because it was complete omission. So I, I'll show you some examples here. So, so this is the original conversation. Resident, who's that? It's me. Good morning. You scared me. And so here we see, this is how it could have been made better. So, the, so here, instead of saying, 
So an alternative to, uh, um, to this statement would be, it's your nurse Kathy. So you're again, you're letting the person know it's your look who you are, and you're also the, again providing cues uh, that orient the resident Kathy. And it's also validating because you can see here the person was the resident was scared. So instead of saying good morning, you could again re help to orient the resident by saying good morning, Jill. Call the resident by name because it is not only recognizing, but it's also kind of helping them um, provide some cues or clues to, to orient them. So, so this is where we had the missed opportunities on their own. There was no other patterns. And, and these are alternative ways to communicate person-centered care. Okay, here's another, he, this is what we found quite often where these, the person was, per, the resident was person sent. No, the staff person was, res, uh, was person centered. So I have arthritis this morning. Is it, it's sore? That's why you had a pillow there. So kind of explaining and validating the fact that, yeah, I know it, it hurts. Um, yeah, it, oh, it didn't help, huh? So, so far the communi the conversation is going really well. Um, then it's kind of switches. Okay, try harder. Put your, got your legs, uncross your legs there. So it just turned into very like, quickly task oriented. So instead of try harder, the staff person could have said, you know, can I do anything to make it feel better? So, prov you know, start up a conversation about what can be done. So that's what we mean again by a person centered alternative. Then the other pattern that we saw was um, missed opportunities on their own and in complete omission. So we're not fixing anything that was said. So here we see, hold on, feet flat down. And then after a pause, ouch, that hurt, you know, by the resident. Okay, okay. So, it's, so there's no acknowledgement about the pain. Um, so she, the staff person could have said, sorry about that, Diane, you know, validate the fact that it, that it hurt. So that was a missed opportunity alone and an omission. And then this is what we saw the most frequently, where these, um, where they were, where were person-centered and then there was a missed opportunity and then a complete omission. So I know these pretty shoes, who got these for you? So that's facilitation, right? That's great. Maureen, so recognizing that Maureen is the daughter, yeah, and then it just went on, it just stopped. Um, and so you could, the person could have said, oh, how is Maureen doing, to again start up that conversation. Okay, so, so we looked at this analysis and then we went back and I thought, hmm, what is happening in the context that might give us clues about when to be person-centered? All right, so here we have, for recognition, we were actually kind of surprised um, that we didn't, a lot of the times the, the staff person didn't call the resident by name when entering or exiting. So these are just really small tweaks that need to be made. So here we have, and turn off the TV, okay, and then staff just exits the room. So all we're saying is, you know, just add a little good night, Edith. So th those are really, what, what I'm arguing for here are not drastic changes. I'm not asking for a, a 50 minute conversation. These are while you're doing the task, just adjust the communication ever so slightly to be person centered. Um, and for negotiation, um, there are a couple of cues. Um, here we see, you know, all right, Donald, here are your glasses. Okay, you look sophisticated. So far, that's pretty good. Give me five. There we go, my buddy. One, and then she goes into one thing, comb your hair. Instead of saying comb your hair, you could ask, you know, would you like me to comb your hair? W are you ready to comb your hair? So any of those, uh, just, just ask. It's really simple but, but important change. Now for facilitation, we found three different um, cues. Um, when the resident is confused, often the staff fail to help. So here, hey Anne, what, what, what about Anne? So the resident is clearly confused here. And then the staff person just says, oh, and continues on their day. So here, an op this is also a missed opportunity. The person, the staff person could say, how are you Anne? which is facilitation and a person-centered alternative. 
Another contextual cue is that if the, if the resident is saying something of value, follow up. So um, the resident says, oh, thank you, you're welcome, I'll take this, yeah. Um, and then the resident says something amazing. After all, I'm in my 80s now. Clearly the resident is proud of the age. Um, and then the staff person says, wow, and then just leaves it at just that. So uh, here you could start up a conversation about, oh, when's your birthday? And, and you, you really that conversation can go all kinds of wonderful places. Um, then the third cue that we found was um, the tasks where the resident has a passive role. If something is being done to the resident, like combing the hair, or in this case, you know, they're just fixing the bed, and then there's just all the silence, you could ask, oh, how was that poetry group you attended? So again, just argue, I'm only arguing for these little, small, uh, but important changes. Now, for val lastly, for validation, we also found three contextual cues. Um, the staff failed to affirm the resident's feeling when he or she um, expressed signs of uncertainty, discomfort, or distress. So here you see, you know, we got a dry, we, you're talking about spring, uh, uh, skin breakdown, and the resident is groaning. And he, and there's some resistiveness to care, you see, uh, here. So the staff says, let me dry your back. Oh, and it, he's groaning, and then the staff says, why not? Gotta be dry there. So instead of that, just say, acknowledge the discomfort, that there are some parts of the actual care that are uncomfortable. And I, by just acknowledging it, it just can soothe and maybe even reduce that resistiveness to care. And the second cue or clue that we found is that the staff didn't reassure residents um, when they may, sometimes the residents will make these self-deprecating comments, like, oh, I didn't do a good job. Well just really affirm their feelings. I think you did. Um, and then finally, staff didn't validate the residents uh, when they express positive emotions. So they're not validating when it's negative, when there's discomfort, or when there's positive statements. So, um, so keep doing that. There's laughter. I can't do, keep doing that, Mrs. Kinsley. So she was doing, the staff person was doing something that made the resident feel really comfortable. And then she, the resident could have said, that would be nice, wouldn't it? So again, I just want to hit home the fact that person-centered care, first of all, is really possible during care tasks. We're not asking for a big major change, but there are these slight adjustments in the communication that can actually change for the better. Um, and this is where staff training is a great opportunity, and that's what um, I'm working on right now, is to really develop a, um, a brief training intervention for um, for frontline staff on how to be uh, person-centered. Because there's lots of cues that we can get from the tasks. So if, so if, if, you're, if they're doing something that's um, pa it's a passive task, um, then that's a great opportunity to engage the resident. Um, and the, the resident has a lot of clues too. If they're expressing a certain feeling, whether it's positive or negative, it's really important to to acknowledge that. I thought I think I will end with that. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. So our um, next speaker, we're just going to keep on schedule here.